John Valade, I want to gossip about changes in the royal family. I know it's a B2B podcast about media marketing and advertising, but I've heard you kind of blow up the old saying that content is king. Tell me about that. You, you've outed me. Blowing up content is king. Yeah. What do you mean? Content is king. Distribution is queen, as we've heard. The, the problem with our industry continuing to use that axiom is it doesn't account for the judge. And, and the judge is usually above the king. So let me see if I can get this quote right, E.B. In the realm of achievement, the one who judges wears the crown. And we're at the service of the judge, and that's the consumer. Brilliant. Okay. Hey, it's E.B. Moss, and this is episode 24 of season two of Insider Interviews, where you get the insider scoop on the business of media, marketing, and advertising. Today, we're getting that scoop from John Valade. He is the head of sales for Premion. Now, he's going to explain it better, but Premion really helps brands reach OTT viewers in all 210 DMAs, regional, local advertisers. They all enjoy it. Yes, even political. He's really terrific at explaining the marketplace, which we all know is changing a lot, and the opportunities for targeting, programmatic, brand safety, you name it, all across the streaming TV universe. We're going to talk about it all, including the lessons they've learned from some recent research studies in CTV and in political advertising, and some of the lessons John's learned along the way in his career. Uh, and I also learned why he's such a deadhead. Anyway, it's a great conversation. I hope you'll listen throughout. And here's John. I'm not judging, but... You have been around in this industry. Now, I only get the best on insider interviews, but beyond your title of head of ad sales at Premion, tell us a little bit about your path to the world of streaming TV. Well, I, the last time I saw you, Evie, we were in New York and you said you thought I had enough gray hair to be on the show, which I, <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate that. And although I'm never... Never quite comfortable with the term expert. One of my favorite sayings is, is I always reserve the right to be educated. And I've been, <laughs> I've been using that cane for 32 years. Um, so I, I appreciate you asking. And so I, I went to Baylor University. I studied communications. I was always a real film, digital, television guy, media guy, um, studied the business thereof, et cetera. So I've been at this for 32, 33 years. Yeah. And by the way, my first real job, EB, and I'm not sure if you've heard the story before, but in 1992, and I'm dating myself, I was running around Waco, Texas, looking for a job in television, looking uh -huh. for something to do on the ad sales side. Nobody had anything. But there was a benevolent guy who called me up as general manager, and he said, look, I, we don't have anything for you, but I understand you're from New Jersey, and uh, maybe you can do collections for us. <laughs> So I took the job in collections and it led to an ad sales role with them because everything I collected, I got to call on. And you know, I found well, out that it wasn't all bad debt. It was just slow pay. I, I got to slow you down there for a second. Um, yep. He asked you to do collections because you were from New Jersey and he figured that he, you were like muscle because everyone from New Jersey, I, including me, knows how to get I think he thought dog. I had mob ties. I think he thought I had mob ties. And, you know, and I, I just let him believe that. And then mm -hmm. I said, am I actually going to be any good at this? And um, it really Turns got me. Yeah, it kind of got me out of the mode of, hey, I, may, I might want to be an on-air talent, which clearly I have a face for radio. And clearly <laughs> ad sales was a better choice for me. But uh, got me into it. And then just from a, a background perspective, you know, spent really great formative years at NBC mm. doing ad sales and business development and even distribution guy by the name of David Zasloff hired me. Sure. We know David. Um, David uh, was great to me early on in my career, very much so. And I think the other formative years for me, I have to point to Hulu changed me as an executive, um, allowed me to do more ad sales in the streaming space, really see how the industry was pivoting. And then also this role of Premion has been amazing because we've, we've done some things locally um, that are really important right now. And uh, So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, 
we'll get into a little bit more of the meat of premium and, and this and that, but do tell us what it is, why it is. Yeah. So, you know, if you go to the website, you can see our pitch of brand safe, CTV, premium, <laughs> advertising at scale. Um, the reality is years ago, uh, Tegna, who owns 90% of premium and Gray, who owns 10% of premium, realized that um, the industry was shifting rapidly and we were losing viewership in the linear side of the business, the local linear side of the business. So I think this started out as a conversation between a consulting firm and, and Tegna on, hey, honestly, what are we going to do to build audience extension? And I, I, I think that possibly Premium underestimated how fast the consumer would move to streaming. And so what Premium does is we aggregate an industry together and we simplify advertising and streaming for local and national spot advertisers. And I, I like to call Premium a liberator because a lot of this was just not available to the local advertiser, and now it is. Okay, so what does that mean for the judge, the consumer? How does Premium yeah, benefit the, that by helping the advertiser? It's a great question. I think the, I think the judge, the consumer, gets more relevant advertising locally. Um, I think they get better targeted advertising. And we see a lot of studies and I, I, this isn't about our study, but I, we see a lot of studies in the industry that talk about, hey, advertisers not only um, are advertising to consumers who are okay with advertising, but they actually like it when they feel like they're being targeted and uh, catered to. Oh, this is an ad of my interest. I'm not getting some random ad for an audience member that's, that's not me or something that right. I can't relate to. So it's, it's given the advertiser more ability to reach those folks and it's created more relevancy in the exchange locally okay that's good so relevancy context those are big words that are out there now and i know another big word big viewership is happening in ctv connected tv um yeah. so you guys in conjunction with our friends at advertiser perceptions you just did a new study i think um, and I'd love for you to just talk about what the meat of that study was. Yeah, we, this is our third year of doing a study with Advertiser Perceptions. And um, it's great. It, it, it came from a basic need. Marketing and sales were talking about, hey, we really need our own data. Uh, a lot of data tends to skew nationally on these studies. Mm -hmm. So we get to build a cohort which speaks a little more to what the national spot and local space is doing. And there's some pretty big takeaways from this study. I think the first was that, you know, it's bonifying and validating that the larger number and a larger percentage of folks are moving more dollars into streaming. I mean, I, we all know that. We talk about it. We see that. But the biggest and mo most important takeaway from the study is that the money is moving out of almost every other channel or medium. So whether it's oh. linear or whether it's display or print, a lot of that money is being re-expressed into streaming. So um, linear is certainly the easier place to repatriate money because you've got the creative. In many cases, you've got the same reps. Uh, you've got similar like-for-like -like impression exchange there. Mm -hmm. So the dialogue is quite a bit about linear to streaming, but this money is coming in from all over the place. When you see the study, um, what it tells me too is that CTV needs to do a much better job at not only talking about a total TV package, but also how we're getting money from some of these other areas where CTV can be more effective. So I guess that means it's being more effective in full funnel advertising so it's not just you know mid and bottom conversion kind of success if you're uh, using CTV for advertising uh, and I guess it also means that if those advertisers are shifting money to CTV then there's proof in the pudding yeah yeah there are big expectations and I, I observed this when I was at Hulu I think that we were on to something 10 years ago I always joke this business is at overnight success 10 years in the making. But we saw then the efficacy of connected TV and streaming juxtaposed to linear. And we saw that they were working very well together and they still work well together. And we certainly at, at Tegna and, and Premium have a total TV message, which is you've got to go after that entire audience. But connected TV drives outcomes. 
And again, some of it's targetability, some of it is attribution capabilities. So we're, we're in that realm now where we're starting to really measure performance more accurately. And there's an expectancy of outcomes. There's an expectancy to drive brand lift and sales and website attribution and other areas, other these KPIs that are continuing to develop for advertisers locally. And again, some of these folks just didn't have any experience with this years ago. It's great to be a part of that so-called liberation team that's come in and provided this at scale. And yes. we're, we're not the only people in the space. So a big competition, of course, but, um, but we were a big first mover to do this. Fantastic. And I know that you're very um, tech conscious and finger on the pulse. So keeping your objective hat on, um, would you say that like linear or traditional broadcast is still in the mix? It's still valuable or is it, if I go back to my royal family <laughs> analogy, <Yeah. laughs> is it is it kind of like it's the prince, but maybe more in a Harry instead of a William <laughs> kind of we, way? We are not, not going to get apparent. away from this analogy today. <laughs> So I look, there's um, our studies are telling us this. And then when we're in the street, when we're out in the street, like Springsteen says, um, there's a preference for total TV. Yeah, people want to. Yeah, we got to go back to the Jersey thing. People want to figure this out. Mm -hmm. They want to see how do I get the total audience? I know it's linear plus streaming, but streaming. I mean, Evie, streaming's 50 percent of all viewing now. in the United It's up to 50 percent now. Wow. Okay. it's 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 getting there. And and I think that 90 percent of households are going to have connected TV and, and smart TV capabilities within the next mm -hmm. year or two. This isn't a throwaway and add on. I even hate when people say it's reach extension because quite honestly, that's pretty big reach on its own. So um, in the Royal analogy, I would say these are, these are knights errant again. These are knights on a mission together, uh, linear plus streaming. So it's like if, if, if Harry and Will reunited the royal family. <laughs> well, so. I am sitting at a round table, so oh, okay. Yes, anyway. you are. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um let's talk tactically uh in terms of how things are bought now and I mentioned earlier that I know Premion is very tech forward. What are you seeing in the programmatic form of uh CTV advertising? Um, is, is that changing? Is that really important for the future? What's happening? I think everyone is acting surprised that the industry has moved in this direction. It's no surprise at all. And again, I'll use that statement I made. This is, oh, wait, this is a surprise 10 years in the making. <laughs> the IAB just released their study that talks about 75% of all connected TV transaction is programmatic. Um, our study said 50%. All right, so let's, Evie, let's split the baby and call it 62.5%. Directionally dominant, um, a plurality of, of buyers now who, who prefer that workflow. And really to stay on top of the issue, the agencies benefit from this greatly because they can optimize very quickly whether they're buying in uh, private marketplaces, um, direct from publisher or through open exchanges. They can also work on their margin. Right. You can drive performance. You can drive points on margin. So I, I and I'm not ashamed to say this either. And, you know, again, this is gray hair talking, but generationally, we have a whole new generation of buyers, planners, strategists who are just raised on hands on keyboards. So this isn't going away. It's not a surprise that there's a big and growing preference for programmatic served through uh, with connected TV. Okay. And um I think it's a fait accompli, honestly, that, that linear, live linear, and streaming all come together in this way. Okay. I might even and, make a prediction on that. Who knows? <laughs> uh, any, uh, any cautionary tale uh, tied to that in terms of like brand safety? Um, is that still a priority or is that still a buzz or brand suitability? The current. Yeah, every survey we've done, EB. Every single survey we've done, this has been clear. Brand safety matters. Mm -hmm. uh, look, the Olympics just reminded us right. of this. M misinformation around political campaigns. AI generated stuff that's not true reminds us of this every day. So certain news executions, although I'm a huge fan of, of buying news, the marketers are cautious. They're trying to navigate this. They don't want to wake up with a headline. Um, mm -hmm. My brand was associated with this or... 
I'm adjacent to something that I can't live with. So brand safety is a, a massive priority. And there are also a number of other things that are top of mind for them coming out of this survey. Okay. I, I mean, that's such a conundrum. If you've listened to some past episodes of Insider Interviews, you know that I've had a couple of folks on talking about the yeah. imperative of advertisers supporting good journalism. And the concern is to not throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, and, you know, find your way to understanding context, as we said earlier. And, you know, if we use the Olympics again, um, a, a shot could be a basketball shot. And so, boy, it yeah. just it makes me news, crazy. News provides incredible thought leadership and opinion leadership. Um, yeah. Again, not saying you don't have to be careful because you, there are certain things you probably don't want your brand around. But right. Um, I, and I grew up in this industry in the news. I, I started, you know, my career with massive exposure to NBC News and the launch of CNBC and the launch of MSNBC and then what those networks became. And I, you know, I was born and, and bred in an industry where news had tremendous value, tremendous sure. value, particularly among key verticals. So big advocate of it. And we as an industry need to do better at, at extolling the virtues of news, but also tamping down stuff that's just crookedly bad. Right. Yeah. Impression for the impression's sake and... Yeah. Right. Um, so any names you can drop, any case studies? I really, I'd love to hear success stories or how you might have coached or guided one of your advertisers to shift some of those dollars or try something new or anything that you can speak to. Yeah. So a lot of advertisers are coming into this space having had the space evangelized to them by us or or competitors, and uh -huh. they just know that the audience movement is there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this question without answering it. This is gonna be so frustrating. Oh my gosh, you so, sound like a sales guy. My, <laughs> my, my grandfather always used to tell me. My grandfather Ralph from New Jersey, who's still alive, he's gonna be a hundred this hey, year. Ralph. He said, he said, Johnny, when you need a heart surgery, you go to the hospital that has done it thousands of times, and the ailment won't be a surprise to them. I think that's it's brilliant. So we see these key issues every single day at Premium. We're working across you know, the, the, the hundreds of agencies, the thousands of clients. So on the street every day, it's being discussed more and more. And I, and I think here's, here's a more important thing for the industry right now. I think there's a tension right now between being sold on connected TV because it's a little bit of a gold rush right now versus being consulted on connected TV and ad supported Good. streaming. At Premium, we're consultants. Um, I, just like that heart surgeon, I want to build experience and repetition and trust. And we don't get it right all the time. Like yeah. anyone who will get on any sort of interview or podcast or even in a room with a client and say we get it right all the time. It is just not true. Technology complicates the business. People say things they shouldn't say. But, but we're here to build experience and, and, and gain that repetition. Just like my grandfather said, go to the heart hospital that's done thousands of these. So um, Premion is a, is a good, successful heart hospital. And that's not a plug for us. It's just with repetition, we've learned. Yeah. And then we do the studies and we do the thought leadership to understand where the voice of the customer is headed and where investment's headed. Well, tell me about some of the, the cool tools. Um, I, I know it's competitive, but tell me how you've innovated and, and how you've created some points of differentiation in the marketplace for a service like Premion. I, I want to get back into the what and the how that you do. Yeah, Evie, the marketplace is as competitive as ever. The supply around connected TV inventory is growing in, in more ways than ever. There are more ways to buy it than ever. There are more reps on the street selling it than ever. There are more companies who have this. So at Premium, what we face every day is we're in an industry of collaboration with our publishers. The publisher, this is another thing that, w that doesn't get talked about a lot. The publishers haven't been so great at selling local. <laughs> and in particular, you know, they're looking for companies to help partner and help market make in the local and national spot space so we can serve the publishers in a really, really great way. Okay. Um, but the, the competition often also turns into co-opetition, which is those publishers also have to go out and sell themselves. So um, we, we need each other. We have great partnerships with them, but we also have done some things to accommodate the, uh, the buy side. So 
In early 2024, we bought our own demand side platform. Uh, I never thought I'd see the day, but we did it um, so that we can have more control over inventory acquisition, more control over direct hands-on keyboard setups. Uh, we also have numerous new partnerships with uh, supply side platforms for PMPs. So we're making changes as we go. And as the customer says, hey, John, look, we love you guys. We trust you guys, but we, we need to start to transact this way. We need more options. So I, I think that's some of the new stuff that we've been up to. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. And then I'll, I'll add one more thing in here, E.B. Tegna's got a new CEO by the name of Mike Steib. He's a digital native. He, he's got huge background at Google and, and NBC. And I think Mike's going to come in and, and set a new vision for what the Tegna Plus Premium business means at large and really leverage mm-hmm. some of the new tools that we've got. Super excited about that. Oh, that's great. And hopefully he respects every gray hair that you earned and sees you as the pundit that you are. Okay, Mike. Uh, I appreciate it. Hey, Mike. <laughs> um, so the components, and you've mentioned that you're an aggregator, and some of those things are local that we talked about, but there's also fast channels, and, you know, the little elephant or donkey in the room, um, political advertising. So... Yeah. Fast channels, let's talk about what they are and why they're growing so quickly. And will they be king? Yeah, so the judges, let's talk about the judges again. The okay. judges like free, the, con- the consumers like free. Um, and, and fast is just another night errand. It's, it's one piece of an overall campaign that you're going to need. So don't overlook fast channels. And I've been totally blown away. I've been mm-hmm. blown away by, and I'm going to leave somebody out and someone's going to, email us and say, hey, like, Tubi, Pluto, Roku, Fubo, Philo, Zumo. These guys have all done really well. And if you look at any of these stack rankings that you see in just in terms of total consumption, they're invariably two or three of them up among the top 10 every single month. So they're attracting massive viewership. Mm-hmm. Um, they're largely consumer friendly. They're very usable. They've got great user interfaces. And I don't Eb, I don't think we've even scratched the surface in terms of what these fast services are capable of technically and interactively in the future. I, I think there's a world where not only measurement's going to be improved through the fast channels, but I think dynamic creative and certainly more dynamic ad serving. Uh-huh. Um, someone asked me the other day whether I thought that this was a platform for new service launches. Absolutely, especially with the viewership they've got. So fast channels are a really key component of not only our business as far as partnership, but key component in terms of keeping keeping things free and ad supported out there. And consumers don't want to replicate their old cable bills. We're, we're starting to get in that direction. That's right. And uh, you know, you're, you're seeing fast services continue to succeed because they respect the consumer as a judge of that. Yes. So, and as a consumer, we know that um, we're paying with our attention um, when we opt yeah. in for fast. Another thing too, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a lot of the fast channel, fast service growth is in local. We have hundreds of local channels that are finding their second and third um, distribution lives, if you will, mm. within the fast channel environment. And that's great. And we're getting a lot of young viewership um, that's looking at that with some ubiquity and saying, yeah, this is interesting. It, why not? Why shouldn't yeah. it be here? I think that makes sense because we're all craving community and I think that that's really important and that actually dovetails into part of my next question which is about political advertising because local is also really key in that space too. Um, So I think that I'm going to read this, wait. Um, So in February, eMarketer forecasted that digital political ad spend would hit around three and a half billion dollars. Um, and and there's been some crazy pants contributions just (laughs) since, uh, we planned this podcast that maybe that super packs. Yeah. Maybe that, uh, money's even in bigger now, but you did another report. I think you partnered with campaigns and elections. What are you yeah. finding in the political advertising realm and how does that dovetail with what premium does and offers? Yeah. CNE has been a good partner for us in terms of pushing some data through to the market. And we, we have our own dedicated political sales team. It's actually branded premium political. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, They work inside the Beltway constantly. They're busy now. They're super busy. (laughs) And I I love talking to them because there's always action, um, Uh especially in the summertime. It's... So look, 86% of all voters watch ad supported streaming. So we have a we have a winner right there in the fact that okay, your your audience, people you're looking to influence are there. And the CNE study that we did confirmed that there's a need for a lot more reach versus mm-hmm. traditional linear. Traditional linear and cable used to be the vehicles. They were the horses you rode to win elections. So add to that local geo-targeted congressional districts, zip codes mattering big time. Streaming absolutely helps win elections. Mm. So, and to your point, now we're, now we're seeing tons of soft money getting poured into the elections, whether it's, whether it's federal, whether it's congressional, gubernatorial, local. And yeah, you know, we, I was joking with somebody several months ago. I said, in order to elect a local judge or a sheriff, you've got to be on streaming now. <laughs> or to change a down ballot measure. For all we know, to get on the PTA or the PTO, you're going to need to do streaming soon, Evie. But you have to go where the audiences are. And, and, and this is a um, kind of a coming out party for, uh, for streaming with political. We've seen a, a massive change. Awesome. Uh, and speaking of horses, John, I want to get a little personal. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to say um, two truths and a lie. But okay. I think that what I read, these are all true. You own a hay farm in Texas. You're a big deadhead. And you wanted to be a radio DJ. But now you're in TV. Am I right on all of those? Did I do my homework I, well? You did your homework. You've been you're talking weird. to somebody, maybe some of the informants at, at Premium. I um, left a couple things on yeah. the table, I'm just saying. We- <laughs> <laughs> we, I might be headed to see the dead again this summer. I saw them at the Sphere. How was they that? They were amazing. Uh, it was it was total sensory overload. It was incredible. I bet. I, it's changed concert viewing forever, and I can't imagine any epic or iconic band not wanting to get in there and get the artistic palette that the Sphere provides. Let's get back to Jersey for a minute. Okay. I'd love to see Springsteen do the Sphere. I would Can you fly- imagine? to Las Vegas for that. Yeah. So, um, and so does that mean that you have to worry about digital out of home and that kind of um, video eating your lunch at all or? I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly, okay. it's certainly emerging. Um, much more important. Look, I, I think we're in a generation where place-based and out of home experiences are really important. Mm-hmm. And, it's getting much more measurable and, yeah. and people like interactivity with it. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it is that whether it eats our lunch or whether it's complimentary, I, I think that's probably a debate that'll go over the next several years. Yeah, but, um, I think it's got to be complimentary. You know, John, back in the day when I was um, doing ad sales marketing on the network side, one of the things that I was so passionate about was uh, like that s- cross platform storytelling. And it just yeah. seems to me, especially as an aggregator, that you can coach your advertisers on building a story that runs throughout and across all of these different platforms. So maybe the payoff is, you know, um, you're promoting Springsteen's latest album um, through video, and then there's QR codes, and then the promotion is to the sphere and you see the ad there and you know but the story has to i think continue and hit the consumer everywhere Could, so. couldn't agree more and look as as eyeballs and impressions and attention and engagement gets further kind of blown apart and we're trying to figure out how to bring it back together yeah i've seen a lot of kind of forward-leaning research that's talking about you know well, well maybe we should be one-stop shops for everything in this in this realm so Mm -hmm. maybe it's streaming plus linear plus online video plus plus you're out of home plus i I mean maybe that's what local is audio yeah and you're and audio absolutely tegna owns uh the locked on network i'm excited about what that podcast has in store for it yep all sports Mm -hmm. and other things i it's great yep and they were an early adopter of that so hats off to them as well yeah, my so, colleague Tom Cox is is resetting the strategy and setting the strategy for Locked On as we uh, as we speak. 
dig it. I'll be sending him my resume. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> John, you have been around the block. We've been joking about that. But, uh, you know, what's really important to me also is that my listeners, our audience, can have some mentoring in in their ears. So are there any aha moments that you had along the way, any mentors that helped you with this kind of role? Give us from your gray-headed sagacious mind how you would advise those entering the industry or existing executives to, I don't know, have empathy or something. Yeah, I, I have been blessed in this business big time. And I don't use that word lightly. Um, mm -hmm. Because there have been difficult times too, but I've had some great mentors. I've had a lot of great mentors and mentors who were experts in different disciplines. You know, I look back and I, you know, it's these people were responsible for making me kind of a mixed martial arts fighter <laughs> in the media business. Mm -hmm. um, some, some things I picked up along the way, which I think are important, which I try to share. I, I read the business trades voraciously every day eagerly every day. I would read read the trades on the long train rides. I used to have the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal on the way in. And then on the way out, I would grab the guilty pleasure of the New York Post or something like that and read it on the way out of town. But um, I had executives, particularly at NBC, who emphasized that, that you really have to stay one step ahead of, of everyone in this business from an informational standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. sp speaking up and sharing. Uh, and, and let's go back to even that. So I'll send tons of information out to colleagues just to say, hey, look, this is what I'm reading. This could be interesting to you. This could be used in a client meeting. This is an, an interesting insight. But also speaking up and sharing with regard to um, issues that you might see in the business. And um, I've sat on issues that I've really believed in in different business settings for years until they've mm -hmm. come to fruition politely, but, but, but just really firmly believe that this is where the business should be going and just see it through. One other thing was an article I had read by Rashad Tabakawala the other day. Terrific writing, terrific insights. And he was talking about the concept of recognizing when it's five to midnight. And five to midnight means, okay, I don't want to let the bell strike midnight when everything in my career is not going right. And maybe I'm in an environment that I'm not challenged by anymore. I'm not learning. Recognize when it's five to midnight so you can leave with all of those relationships intact. And you can do something when you're leaving on a positive Note, And I, I think I've been pretty good at that in yeah. my career. I've been to a few different spots and not saying that I've been to bad spots, but just, okay, I think that two years was what I needed here or three years was what I needed here. And then you move on and wow. you're constantly reinventing yourself. I, I love that. And I'm going to personalize that because uh, I used to be a little bit apologetic for having what I called a patchwork quilt of a career until someone told me, no, you have a portfolio resume. And, and I like that because my several years here and several years there has really added up to be able to speak to someone like you uh, or someone talking about news or digital out of home. And, and so I appreciate that analogy as well. Um, one of the other people that I spoke with uh, was the head of marketing at Deno and Linda Bethay, and they're the largest B Corp. Uh, you know, the brand names Dan and Avion. And she always um, talks about brand purpose. So at our six minutes to midnight, take the last minute and talk to me about your, your personal brand or how brand purpose kind of figures into uh, the work at Premium or on the personal side. This was a great question, and I, I really thought about this, and I had it here, but I was trying to figure out how to, how to best articulate it, and I think brand purpose to me has always been a promise, a covenant, and I, I don't use word, that word lightly, mm -hmm. and an expectation. Mm -hmm. So no matter what transaction or what transformation you're trying to cause in life, there's a, there's a promise between giver and receiver, and it could be at Starbucks or it could be a $50 million Olympic campaign or it could be the way you interact with a colleague or the way you encourage a friend or a family member. You know, the, the name Hulu always resonated with me, EB. And, and, and in another language, I can't remember which language it is, but it means keeper or holder of precious things. Really? So, so that, that, that concept of I'm holding a consumer relationship, I'm holding your content, 
your inventory, your client. Um, I'm holding a promise of what I, what I said I'm going to do, I'm going to do. Uh-huh. So, and then personally for me, it's, it's always been about my faith. And serving other people. It's my only purpose. I tell people all the time that I work with, it ain't about profit. It ain't about process. It ain't about promotion. It's about people. When you look back on a career of 30 years or however long you're going to work or whatever you're going to do, you remember the people. Yeah. You, You can't remember every little detail of every business deal and what happened, but you remember the people and the feeling you got and, and how you served each other. And I, I like to bring that into the premium space as well. I, this is more meaningful than just a job. It really is. It's, yeah. it's, you know, we're leaving legacies in this business. Well, I've had the good fortune of seeing you speak and then even interviewing you on stage um, and now chatting with you and what feels the way podcasting does really intimately as I see you right on my screen. And, and you definitely walk your talk, John. You clearly have personal brand purpose and and you always speak from the heart and i always learn from you so with that um i want to ask you one more question i want to learn with all the tonnage of tv what are you going to be watching in 2025 (laughs) or the new season i want to see that matlock show linear yeah hopefully it's on ctv also come on don't mess with kathy bates yeah no what are you what are you looking forward to I've got some go-tos, and I also have something that I'm, I'm teeing up, uh, and my what? wife and I are excited about it. Cobra Kai. I cannot wait for season six of Cobra Kai. Wow. I'm an 80s junkie living through all these young, misbehaved <laughs> teens. Um, and then a couple of other things. Uh, YouTube. I follow Pete Santanello. I don't know if you've ever seen Pete Santanello. He's a travel logger, and he goes out to different societies within America, um, different cohorts, people groups within America, and really explores them from the most empathetic way you can possibly imagine. So oh, he'll go to yeah. people living in a very isolated environment in Alaska, or you know, he'll go visit um, the Hasidic Jewish population in New York so that we can get a better understanding of how they live and their traditions. Or he'll go to the uh, East LA car culture and just talk to folks about, hey, what's it like to be in the lowrider culture? It is <laughs> fascinating to me. And I love the way he is a friend of all. And he, yeah. he walks in and he just, he extracts this super, super rich discussion. Very meaningful. We just wrapped up Griselda on Netflix. Scary to see Sofia Vergara uh, <laughs> in a position where she's yes. killing people. And, and then EB, super exciting in the world of the Valade family. What? I've been watching a lot of Major League Baseball lately, streaming a lot of Major League Baseball because my nephew plays for the Detroit Tigers. So we're all excited about that. I remember. That. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. I'm, you know, yeah. one step away, a base away from greatness. Can I get the <laughs> autographed baseball? <laughs> okay. We saw him hit his first home run a couple of weeks ago in Detroit. And Tell uh, me, say I, his name again. Yeah, Ryan Valade. Can we get him on the yeah. podcast? I, I'm sure he would love it. He's doing some great philanthropic work with a charity called Keeper of the Game, Aww. which brings baseball to kids who basically can never experience baseball because of uh, any special mm. needs they might have. It is amazing. And I'm involved with that as well. My, it's a family charity, if you will. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, my friend. John Valade, oh. this was an amazing conversation. I'm smarter, I laughed, I got to know you. I still don't understand why you have a hay farm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Next episode, hay okay. farming. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, check Thank these. you, Evie, great to see you. <laughs> you as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode and learned more about Premion and got to know John Vallade as well and picked up on the value of a good B2B podcast. If you want one for your company, please reach out. I'm at Moss Appeal anywhere. Or if you just want to support this fabulous free content, find me at buymeacoffee.com slash Moss Appeal. A big thank you to John Clayton for my theme music, but truly thank you for listening, learning, and sharing insider interviews with me, E.B. Moss.